Hello everyone, my name is Diana and today my topic is the beauty of women. So, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm, I'm a software developer for a transport, that's what I do. And I only started programming series, full-time series at the beginning of this year, so it's been a really interesting five-month journey. Um, I initially knew I was going to get into I, I, knew, I always knew I'd get into some sort of technical profession. I loved tinkering with things, I loved building things. And last year, what really got me into programming was building a drone with a friend of mine. So we built that out and it became a challenge when we realized we couldn't, we didn't really know how to program it too much of a journey. So I thought, well, this would be a useful skill to have, but I put that on hold. Um, I finished my A levels last year and then I spent six months working for a small education company in Johannesburg. And I came back to Nairobi and joined Moringa School, which is a three month coding program, immersive, where I learned HTML, CSS, Ruby, Rails, Java, and Android development. Then afterward, I joined Maramuja, which is where I am. So that's a little bit about me. So I'm going to throw out a question to you guys. So, what is your uh, uh, I'd say open source is um, open source for anyone, anyone can contribute, change the code, maybe give some that's my understanding of open source. Okay, thank you for that. Anyone else? I'd like to give to the what is, what is everyone's understanding of what open source is? Yeah. Okay, code basically is free to download. It's easy, um, just it's accessible, and that you can study it, you can see the internal workings of it, and if you have the skills, you can uh, make, make changes to it, distribute it, and so on. Okay, yeah. so thank you both for that. And I will now move into open source within the Ruby community. So, what does open source within our community, within Ruby, mean to everyone, especially if you're a developer who's used um, gems or any other sort of code that's non proprietary? Today I chose to share projects that I did with my friend of mine that really demonstrate for me this really um, the highlight of what we So this project is called Nairobi Tech News Aggregator, for lack of a better name. I wrote it with a friend of mine, his name is Willem, and he isn't here with us today. So I wanted to make something that would allow us to play around the box of full tech. We did a primary school for two months learning programming, doing very intensive projects, and we wanted to build something of our own. We wanted to make something useful. Anyone who's been in the tech space in Nairobi knows that it's a very sort of closed community. Not closed in the sense that you can't get in, but if you are a beginner, it's very difficult to find information that encompasses the entire space. There's all these exciting innovations happening, but there isn't really one central place where you can find information about that. There's the eyes of the blog, which is very informative, there's individuals, influential individuals within the tech space who have their own blogs, but really you don't have a central thing you know, for information, that, and that was a problem that we identified. We also wanted to make something that would allow us, and finally make something that we could finish. Anyone who's been doing sort of programming on their own, sometimes it's really difficult to build something out and see it in the end. Many times you start something and when it gets difficult or when you can't find the support that you need, it's very easy to be tempted to give up and say, well, I'm going to start doing something else or I'm going to do a different employer. We wanted to challenge ourselves to actually see something through from the initial scaffolding of rails to something that people could actually use. So um, this is what, these are some of the functionalities that our app had. It fetches posts from an unlimited number of our sets feeds. It automatically fetches these by the background worker. It displays all the posts on the top page, scrolls those posts to your database. I'm just going to run through these because I want to give you the demo, which is a lot more important. Make everything full text searchable via Elasticsearch, allow visitors to create user accounts, allow visitors to bookmark posts, and allow visitors to share posts on those This is a local version of our app. and. I will just demonstrate how it works and then we can jump into some of the more interesting sort of open source concepts behind this. It wouldn't make me more interesting if somebody volunteered to come and help me to test this. Okay, just come on.
currently looks like, and you can see all these stories that are being pulled from different sort of websites. So this one comes from TechBees, and every five minutes you have different sort of stories coming in depending on the words, how those websites are being updated. Now some of the more interesting things we add to our search. So um, who wants to give me a search item? Just throw something out. showing you the basic functionality of the app, I want to talk about what this has to do with my, with my topic, which is the beauty of open source. So looking at this, most of this was not done by us because as I said, I'm very new to this and building out some of these background workers, doing the doing front end page would be a lot of work. And we built this in 10 days. That's what the open source space comes in. Because other people have built, other people have built up more. So now that we've built out this we built this thing out and we've made something. What next? We're open to collaboration. The code is freely available on GitHub right here. It's easy to set up and customize. We have a VP, we have a contribution guide, and we would like to really see this project something we know because, again, open source means lots of people coming together, so it's something useful and going to be useful. Finally, if you really don't remember anything else that I said, I invented it. Came up with this. So the three C's, the three C's of open source according to me. First one, code. If you're a developer and you read, me, I love, I love to write code. I love opening my browser and seeing what has come up as a result of what I typed into the editor. Write as much code as you can. Secondly, collaborate. Get together with other people. Get other people to look at code, look at your code. There is this quote from Linus from Vault. Worth enough. But with enough arms, all bugs become shadow. So that basically means that if you have enough people looking at code, there, is a, there really isn't a bug that you can't fix. And finally, contribute. Now that you've benefited from the open source community and from somebody else's, somebody else's code, give back to the community, write your own code. Remember the three C's, code, collaborate, contribute. Hi guys, um, my name is Eugene, I'm Who am I? Uh, I'm a front-end developer, uh, full stack, four years now, self-taught. If JavaScript was Naomi, I'd be Ruth. If you know Naomi, it's from the Bible. Ruth told Naomi, wherever you go, I will go. Whatever you eat, I will eat. Whatever language you will talk, I will talk. So that's me and JavaScript. Um, I love building web applications uh, using domain driven design. So we sketch out the app from the UI to the backend to the database modeling and everything that. Yes, I've stated I'm a Nairobi JavaScript community lead. Um, also, I have consultant currently and Bitmob CTO, Bitmob.com. I'm in charge of the creation of the extension. It helps you shop in Amazon uh, using an extension. And we like deliver everything, every good that you shop from Amazon and 25 other global websites to your doorstep. So, this is a brief history of JavaScript. JavaScript was created in 1995 by Brian A. Um, it was engineered at Netscape and first used in Netscape 2. Um, it was originally called LiveScript, but then it was renamed to JavaScript. So, because back then Java was a very, if you know Java, uh, it was a very famous language back then, and they wanted to write on, uh, on, on like, uh, I, don't, I don't know how it's called, like, but, but they wanted to write, write on top of the theme of Java. So they renamed it from live, live script to JavaScript, and it actually worked. But since then, uh, it has made everybody confused, everybody relating JavaScript to Java, of which they do not have so much in common, though there are few modern syntaxes and designs from Java. Uh, yeah. So also, he borrowed a bit from C uh, back then because those are the most famous languages back then. Uh, JavaScript is, is an object-oriented, a dynamic language. It, it's, 
Charles types and operators, and that builds objects and methods. It is also a functional language, so you don't have to code entirely on object oriented uh, with an object oriented design. Uh, the key differences is JavaScript does not have a class, instead it has prototypes, which it accomplishes the classes using objects prototypes through inheritance and so much fun, and constructors. Uh, the other thing is the objects give uh, well, uh, the objects fun uh, a function can be an uh, is actually an object in JavaScript, meaning that the function can be, be moved around like a variable. Those are the key differences. So, what is the uh, what is this keynote for today? Uh, anybody who has uh, got confused about JavaScript, the usual JavaScript enthusiasts like a refresher course um, to help you also connect Ruby and JavaScript. Uh, all, and if you're always here to learn something new. Uh, another thing is to prove that JavaScript is not jQuery. I, should, I swear I should insist on that. JavaScript is not jQuery. jQuery is a library written in JavaScript to easy your DOM manipulation. Thank you. So, yes, JavaScript is not jQuery. And the uses of JavaScript on the browser is computation, DOM manipulation, animations, game creations, and graphic style, if you have had a WebGL and Canvas. Uh, it also nowadays has gone further to access your hardware. So you can access your graphics card, you can access your camera, you can access your microphone, and, and everything else, and a lot more hardware in, in your laptop. I can't mention, mention all of them right now. So uh, JavaScript helps Ruby do the things that Ruby can't. Ruby is a server side language. JavaScript is a client side language. So they need to work together to make a beautiful application. Other uses of JavaScript, um, it's all, it's also does robotics. Uh, so if you have a Raspberry Pi, Chelsea, and Arduino, yes, JavaScript can program them now. Uh, it also creates command line tools, thanks to Node.js and IOJS because of that. Uh, it's, all, it's also a database language. Uh, famous languages known to have uh, written their query languages uh, is Code DB and everything DB, in which they have written their, query, uh, their queries using the JavaScript language. Uh, it's also be, you can be used to create nat native-like applications, close, close to native-like applications. They are known as hybrid applications. These tools enable uh, a Codoma, the general app, app as the narrator, uh, Ionic framework, and native script, which is new. So a little bit about how the web works. So this is the simplest form of how the web works. You have a device, you have a laptop, you open a browser, and when you enter your URL, it's simply telling the server, yo, what's up, get me this. And the server says, hey, here the server, nothing, uh, or there's nothing like here, man, or I don't know what you're talking about. So this one, these responses come differently using status codes, which are uh, put in brackets. So if the star stuff, the status is 200, if there's nothing like that, usually it's, uh, so actually it's 200, that's a mistake, it's 404. And if, there's, if the server does not know what you're talking about, it's either 45, and request the method not allowed, or 500. So, uh, okay, so I'll go to the next slide, so before I can come back to that. So the language that the web communicates around is hypertext, hypertext transfer protocol. So things to note about HTTP, which you've heard about it and never uh, really concentrated about it, is that everything is a stream. Everything is a stream. Then the web communicates using streams, be it the page that comes to your browser, be it the picture that comes to your browser, be it the, uh, the pictures and videos comes, comes in forms of buffers. Uh, if you drill that down on Google Maps form, you'll, you'll learn more. Another thing is stateless. It does not know who is sending the data, it does not know who is receiving the data. The, uh, uh, so the last thing is the verbs. You use verbs to, to communicate uh, on the web. So this verbs, if I take you back to that uh, slide, is, these are the verbs. Get, head, which is actually like asking for data. Post, put, and patch. Add, stroke, change some data. If you follow the REST API buttons, these are, the, these, are just, these are just the basics, but if you follow the REST API buttons, then you'll, you'll learn more about it about these verbs and how they are used to communicate with the servers correctly. Okay, so um, soon after JavaScript was created, a few years later, people encountered problems. They wanted to update the, uh, what, the, the applications 
or the site you're visiting without reloading the browser. And that's Ajax's ball. Ajax means asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So what's asynchronous? In simple terms, yeah, as simple as possible, page, the page does not have to reload or wait for the request to be completed. It's not like you have to reload the page or the page reloads itself. The user can carry on doing whatever he wants and the page is updated while he's, yeah, he's browsing the, the, the website. Uh, everything was as usual. So it was uh, asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So what's XML? XML is a, uh, it's a language used to communicate across uh, uh, browsers, uh, the browsers and the server. And uh, actually even across uh, other languages. Back then, XML was used, but then JSON was introduced. And XML is still used in, uh, in other areas, but JSON is now the most popular form of communication between languages. Um, so, the API that makes Ajax request is XML, HTTP request. Exactly like that, XML, HTTP request. That's the API that makes Ajax request. Um, in Rails, if you want to confirm that it's an Ajax request, you have request to exit dot his chart or check confirm that it's an Ajax request. Then in, in the client side, the browser, we use jQuery wrappers for uh, JavaScript itself. There is dollar sign dot Ajax dot get and dot post, depending on the request you're making. So how do we send that to the servers? One, through the URL. When you key in Facebook or Twitter.com, that's actually sending that to the servers and requesting the page. The other one is post when you submit a form or using Ajax, using Ajax to submit uh, data and get back data. The, the last one is the one I've mentioned, which is JSON. Uh, so how do we get data back? So we get data back in this form as HTML, the whole page itself, when you create Twitter.com, the whole page is sent back from the server, and that's what you view in the browser. The other thing is HTML fragment. This is used to update the, uh, the page tiny bits of the page so that uh, you can you can you can keep the user uh, keep, keep getting that keep getting that the last one is bootstrapping JavaScript. So this is rendering the whole HTML so the JavaScript and manipulations. Oh yeah and the last one JSON which I've talked about. So this is how it looks at uh, looks like the in the, in the server. This is ERB uh, Ruby's for its templating language. So, uh, if you look at the first part, uh, I hope it's big enough. So, let's say you're welcoming a user to, to, the, to the website, and it's hey, so that's a new uh, ERB templating language. You pass a variable, and you want to uh, write the correct username to, or call up the correct username, depending on the username the user use. So, uh, if, you, if you go down, you see the script, the script type, script to type, that's how you actually uh, add JavaScript through a file to your page. Then, just below it, that's how you add JavaScript directly to the page. You wrap it between the script files. So in this case, we want to get the tweets uh, related to the user. And we, uh, we also pass a Ruby variable tweets to JSON. The, two, the two JSON converts the data to a JSON format which JavaScript can understand. So, what does the browser receive? So, this, this, the one I'm showing you right now, is how it gets to the browser. So, this, this is exactly what the browser receives. So, if you go back and see that it's set, uh, the variable to, to, to JSON is converted to actually um, what, an, an array of tweets. Then below, the JavaScript can look through the array of tweets presenting them to the, to the user. So, what's JSON? JSON is JavaScript Object Notation. It is, it's, a, it's a new form of sending data across languages and to the browser from the, from the server side. Uh, do you remember, please do remember that everything comes in, in, in strings. So, JSON actually is sent as a string, not as JSON itself. And when it gets to the browser, it is then passed and it's converted back to JSON, which uh, not just the browser also, uh, it, whatever language receives it has a passing function that passes the JSON from the string to the JSON itself. So this is an example of how JSON looks when it's being sent across 
uh, languages and into the browser in this case between Ruby and the browser on, in an Ajax request. So, how do you make an Ajax request? How do you make an Ajax request back to Ruby? Let's say you wanted to get uh, a collection of tweets related to some form of IDs. So you get you run the IDs to a data to a data variable using JavaScript. This is the vanilla or the plain JavaScript way of making an Ajax request. Um, if you look at the bottom part of it, you'll see that xhar.send, json.stringify. Remember when I told you that everything in the web is sent and received through strings? Then you have to convert your JSON into a string before you send it to the servers. Then from the servers, Ruby can receive it and convert it back to JSON or an array or an object. Then do the manipulations that it's supposed to do. So, to confirm to you that JavaScript is not jQuery, I, I wrote the request using pure XML HTTP request, the slide you're looking at now. Now, to, to show you that actually, this is actually what jQuery does in the library. Here's the next slide. But it's actually pretty beautiful because it turns all the 20, around 20 lines of code into one line of code, the last one. So it, it's a dollar sign of get the URL that you want to get the tweets from, the data you want to send to, and pass tweets is actually a function that you see the request back, and you want to request the direct form of JSON. So, how do you request a uh, data in form of JSON from Ruby? There, if you look at the code, you can see down there, format with JSON. So you can do all the manipulations that you want to do. In this case, I'm getting tweets related to the user ID, and I only want the ID and the messages and the time created. Then I want to send the data back in form of JSON. So down there, if you look at format with JSON, render, then that's how you get data back in form of JSON from Ruby. That's how you convert data, if it's an object, if it's a, an array, to JSON, then send it back to JavaScript. So this is JavaScript receiving an Ajax request. Below, if you look at it, I've added another line, past reads. Remember I had hidden it from the previous slides. So the single line of jQuery that makes the request has a function called past reads. Below, the past reads gets the tweets from the servers. Uh, I've, I've done my best to write it in plain play or in readable, in a remote readable language. So in, in the function passage, you see tweets from servers. Then you see a variable called data. Then you see the function that I told you that is available across all languages. In this case, this is JavaScript, and it's json.pass, then wrap the tweets from the servers, and you have your tweets. Then if you want to further get your tweets because they, they are being wrapped inside a, a variable known as tweets, you write that on the tweets, and you get all your tweets, and now you can look through them and present them to the user without the, without the user having to reload his or her page. Now, what are the users of JavaScript? Uh, you can create a single page application. In this case, a single page application is an application that does not need require reloading. Uh, it refreshes different parts of the page, and it can be powered by Ruby. It doesn't have to be completely front end. Ruby, is, Ruby helps JavaScript or front-end applications in terms of saving data because you need to save data and present data to the user in different processes in his friend's laptop, in his works, in the, in his works shops desktop, or maybe at home, his own laptop or mobile phone. You need to store data by passing it back to Ruby to store it from you and tell the Ruby that you need to keep the data. In this case, Ruby. Um, there is no reloading and it's not refreshing. Uh, if you want a very intuitive app or a good user experience such as Facebook, such as Twitter, where the page does not reload, that presents data to the user on request, then you have to use JavaScript and maybe you have to use JavaScript in, on, on a very large scale. Also, if you want to, use, to move data manipulations, simple or hard data manipulation, depending on, your, on what you want. You can leave all data manipulations to Ruby on the backend. But if you feel that JavaScript can do the data manipulations, you can move it to the client side. This helps you actually decouple or actually release, uh, run, or memory use when making requests to Ruby, such that you're actually using the user's laptop's processing power to actually process the data presented to him instead of using the server. This is very important 
where actually you have a very large scale of users. Maybe in this case, maybe you have, you have 1 million users pinging your server every second. So if you do the calculations on the server side, you actually have to Ruby. And you don't want to have Ruby if you have Ruby. So you actually move the, the processes actually to the front end. And now you make, you make it work together with JavaScript so that JavaScript can process some data and Ruby can process some data, equalizing actually the load of the data that is supposed to be uh, processed. Now, the below, the way I stated is saving data back to the servers. In this case, Ruby will affect the user or the progress of the user. Another thing, Ajax is very fast because you're actually sending many chunks of data. And in this case, you're not requesting a whole page, you're not requesting HTML, you're not requesting a picture. You're actually requesting just a mini chunks of data depending maybe the idea of the user, maybe the data of the user. So, uh, why use JavaScript and why address and all these things that are coming up through uh, JavaScript? Websites are actually turning into web apps. They're becoming pretty heavy. And I have no idea what web apps are turning into. I looked for a while, I did not get one, but actually get a, I got an image which is actually pretty cool to show how web apps are becoming now. They're pretty evil. Yeah. So, um, an example there, if I can show you, is a, a, a previous project that I did. Uh, the project is known as Gulia, it's a rainbow conservation project uh, through IM Consulting. And we had to use a lot of JavaScript for the processing of data, of maps, and presentation. So this is all the JavaScript we require. And this I have not scrolled. I have not scrolled. This is what you see. So if I scroll, you can see the hand that we actually we are, we are going through. So, I don't know, none of you have done something like that. This is pretty crazy. This is my first time to do something like this. So if you look at all that JavaScript, that's what I'm telling you that actually web apps are becoming pretty evil. So I I showed a few a couple of people and these were their responses. <laughs> <laughs> so I showed it to Julian and that was his response. Then I showed somebody else and this was his response. So yes. And, that's the, and he actually, the page shows exactly how we feel when you're writing such heavy projects. So, front end development will have become a pretty big nightmare without the progress that JavaScript has undergone, and that also the progress that Ruby has undergone. Ruby right now is at version 4.0, and the JavaScript right now, uh, by May or by summer, they will be introducing ES6, which is the newest version of JavaScript after nine years. The last version was chapter uh, 2005. That is ES5. There is no ES4, so ES5 took place for ES4 uh, in, in a protocol known as Harmony. So, next I'm going to show you the progress that JavaScript has made that has helped us combat such evil web apps. Uh, to note that she meant, uh, the previous presenter mentioned that actually. Uh, in our current situation right now, in the progress of web development, it's becoming pretty, pretty hectic for beginners to dive into web development because of all the tools and everything that which is coming out. Web apps are becoming much more evil, evil and more than Osama bin Laden. And so, how does a user begin using all these tools and frameworks and JavaScript and Ruby itself? So, today I'm going to take you through JavaScript, as I know other people will take you through Ruby. So I'm here to take you through the JavaScript and the tools that we use and everything that has been mentioned around you that you keep uh, saying, I'm floating. Yeah, I'm floating. So everybody says, what are you talking about? What the hell are you talking about when you mention ball, not yes, uh, task observation and everything else. So let me take you through the today. So this problem, these are the problems we are facing. Websites are turning into web apps uh, and web apps are becoming pretty evil. Code complexity grows and society grows, as you've seen on the previous illustration I've shown you. Assembling the code becomes harder. Then, developers want to squeeze the JavaScript files and modules. Deployment wants to optimize the code with just that one or a few lines of HTTP requests that are made to the servers. Remember that with the code I've shown you, we are making over 60 requests to call JavaScript alone. It's a lonely page itself which is not actually healthy for the browser. But I hear with the HTTP 2.0, which is coming out, things will change a bit. So if we wait for that, then I can talk about that later on. Tasks and codes are becoming repetitive. 
So there are simple tasks that you carry out every day when you start a new project. And also the whole of connect, maybe connecting the database, or maybe uh, asking for a cookie, selling a cookie, connecting to the local uh, database on your browser, on a browser, SDB, uh, and SQL, SQL, what? Like SQL, like SQL was dropped, so now it's intended to be. So such actions are becoming repetitive because almost all web apps and websites are demanding such kinds of functionality. The code bill because it becomes too large for files to file debug, debug, debug. Believe me, we really have a high time debugging of 60 lines of code. Because now, if one code reset, each of the files depends on the other. You have to go through 60 files and start as and or start with the file that made the problem, go through the file to find where the problem came from. Also, you want remarking for product development. You want your code to be as small as possible. This is actually, I think it's repetitive. Now, the solution to front-end developers are as following. So we want some sort of, I have no idea why JavaScript does not have importation, but in year 6, importation is being introduced. So JavaScript, one thing, does not have importation. So you actually cannot import files or require them as needed uh, compared to Ruby or other backend languages. Um, ability to load nested dependencies. This complements on the first point where when you want actually to use a library that was, that was actually required from a previous file, that is actually it actually is there, it, it has been inherited, like classes or in the backend development code. Another thing is some of the forms of uh, this is, I think is repetitive, some of form of repetitive tasks and automation. Scaffolding, uh, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. Meeting, which is actually checking your code for errors. Automation, real time for error and report and, and bug reporting. Then you want cheap ready development. So these are the solutions we have, which have come up over the years. And so I'm going to unravel it. That is a good smiling. He's a very pretty evil guy, but he's smiling because I'm going to unravel him. Yes. So I've tried to group the tools into seven sections. So these are the two, this, these are the tools, and this is the age of the tools. Without these tools, you cannot carry on development or heavy work on projects. <coughs> so what which are these tools? So the first ones are preprocessors and precompilers, transpilers, task attributions, package management, scaffolding tools, versioning tools, and templating systems. So we'll go through them one by one as I finish, finish them. So the first one, preprocessors. CSS, you've heard about it. And if you use Ruby, you're mad about SAS. SAS was actually the first preprocessor for CSS to come out. And it has pretty went, pretty gone and heavy development, and it's pretty awesome right now. As CSS did not, does not count in the tools that SAS provides. Which tools am I talking about? Can you run a function inside CSS? No, you cannot run, run a function inside CSS. Can you compare, or can you make a color lighter by just multiplying with another color. No, you cannot do that in plain CSS. So that's where SAS came in and less post CSS and stylus. So less post CSS and stylus came in after SAS and all these are preprocessors for CSS. They make CSS development pretty cool and pretty rapid. Another thing is coffee stream, which was mentioned previously by Aaron, right? Yes. So it was mentioned previously by Aaron. Coffee script makes JavaScript development pretty easy. It, um, just like uh, Sleep, which is a game for Ruby, which makes it easy to write HTML, the CoffeeScript makes it easy to write in JavaScript by removing things like closing brackets and by just using notation. Another thing is JIT. If, uh, how many people have used HAM? If you are a Ruby developer, how many people have used HAM? So actually, they made a front-end processor which copied HAM, which is known as JIT. So if you have used HAM, moving to JEL from uh, HAM is pretty easy. So JEL is a preprocessor language for HTML without the need of a backend language. So this is an example of using uh, SAS in SizeKing Compass. Compass complements SAS, which is a, is a helper for the preprocessor. So up there, I have never understood why browsers cannot come into one single understanding in naming things like CSS variables, or no, CSS features. So in this example, when you're adding a gradient, in, in Mozilla, you have to, have to add both in 
Chrome and what? Well, in Chrome and Opera, you have to add WebKit and O. Then in Microsoft, you have to add hyphen MS. And then you have to have the normal one, which is linear gradient. I have no idea why these guys can just use one of it, like linear gradient. It doesn't agree that you are supposed to use one of it. This has pretty much a broad problem because now when you write your CSS, you have to write over six tabs to actually uh, declare uh, the background linear gradient. We use it six tabs. If you if you see there, we see the linear gradient, web key, all that linear gradient, and mess and everything. Now, but with us, that's where the glory comes in. A simple line of code, if you can see. So SAS takes care, takes care of everything. Now SAS notices that you've added a, a gradient or a background image. Then when you've added the gradient, SAS compiles it and when it's compiled, it compiles to the grandma, the grandma CSS. I call it grandma CSS because SAS is actually born out of CSS itself. So the kids, obviously, kids are always cooler than their parents. Every generation of kids is cooler than their parents. So that's why I call it grandma CSS. It's pretty new. Uh, I'm not sure when it, it, it was introduced, but the hype went around a lot this year. Transpilers actually introduced ES6 to browsers that do not have ES6. With ES6, which is the new version of JavaScript, it will change completely how you write JavaScript. JavaScript did not have classes with ES5. No, it has, has classes. Then they have introduced other patterns such as deconstructors. De uh, they have introduced generators, they have introduced uh, what? Uh, weak mapping, which is actually further uh, array manipulations without the need of having a library. With this introduction, ES6 will take a few or a, a few years before actually people update their browsers completely. Remember that who was using uh, Windows Explorer 6? Most probably, I'm sure they are. And uh, actually, people who are using something like okay, Chrome nowadays are not updates, but the people I'm sure who are using something like Mozilla 4 or 5 or even 15, which now do not support A6. So, how do you make people, uh, your code be supported or backwards compatible? You use trans transpilers. So, an exa examples of trans transpilers is Bubble.js, Track 1, which is introduced by Google. Uh, I do not know exactly how to spell that, I'll say. So, I'm just guessing. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other one is TypeScript. TypeScript has a most traction in public year coming up. TypeScript was one of the first transpilers, which now helps introduction of ES6 to the browsers which do not support ES6. Because current browsers, all browsers you're using right now support ES5. So an example of ES6 is that this, this is when, when you're using TypeScript or other. So, as you see there, for the first step, JavaScript, you can declare a class. Another thing, you can declare interfaces. Then, all this is, com is compiled into ES5. So when it is compiled to ES5, how does it look like? Play all good on ES5 JavaScript. And the, and the browsers won't complain, like, what the hell did you give me? Like, I can't talk, I can't read this compile, or I can't compile this code. So, transpilers help transform ES6, your ES6 code to ES5. Build systems. Um, as I told you, when you're writing a pretty web, heavy web app, you have to split your codes into chunks. Like in this case, we split our codes into 60 files, into 60 chunks of files. And when you split your code into 60 files, why are you splitting them? So that your code can be easily, you can easily, what, maintain your code. You can easily debug your code. Unlike writing over 10,000 or 20,000 lines of code. But the problem is, as I say, JavaScript that is not, that does not have the potential or required dependencies or actually injecting the nested, nested dependencies or actually even loading or lazy loading dependencies. So maybe you do not require jQuery, but you only require no. So what's, uh, what's the difference between backing up on uh, hard disk? How many people have lost hard disk? Me. How many people have woken up today and found out that the hard disk is not working? Yes. How many people have actually dropped their hard disk and like that's the end of your project? Like you had backed it up there alone and you dropped your hard disk. How many people have broken projects with flash disk and actually lost the flash disk? 
Then why, why the hell are you afraid to just skip? Like you will never lose anything for you. You know, it's a it's a cloud it's a cloud machining system. So actually, when you mark up your project into Git, and here here's one thing people don't know about Git. When you actually run, or let me take you through the process. So Git add hyphen a as all the files to the Git to the Git configuration and directory. Then when you add all, uh, I think I have not used the right words, but you actually add all the files to your project. Uh, it actually it's actually telling Git that you should watch all these files. Then when you run git commit stroke a m uh, 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 a stroke a is the same a m stroke a the hyphen a is like the, the, the previous one that I've written but actually now that's the short form for right the right writing just a single line of code that will actually add all your files to be watched by git and the m is the message so the message is actually to remember your snapshot so what do I, what do I mean by snapshot? Let's say you made over 50 commits or a thousand commits. Git actually remembers the project at every specific commit. So you can actually go back to your first commit without affecting the previous or where you are right now. Okay. So that's the good, that's the great thing about Git. So when you make a mistake, you can always go back and check your previous versions of Git. So this is an example of yeah. So when I actually put a game to laptop, I, I was so afraid by game that I woke up one day at 3 a.m. and I was like, I want to get, get my life. I wish you could do that, like you can fashion control your life, you know. You can go back to when you're like five years old. I know this is not allowed. So this is actually a video to show oh, this guy that wanna agree with me. So, so um, for those guys who do not understand the job, that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to finish, to wrap up, uh, to finish up, so actually I finished in time. Um, your job as a developer is easy just to develop. You didn't get into development, I know you got into development because you want to do uh, money, a lot of it maybe. Uh, somebody told you there's a lot of money in coding, but with that mentality you want to go pretty far. So why do you develop? need to develop and continually grow and uh, up to date I've never been employed. That's the truth. Because I want to keep growing. I want to be a bit further where I am. I'm not saying employment is bad, but to me to me employment is bad. To me, to me. But if you can actually maintain your employment or your job and maybe extend a few hours of the night just for yourself, not for your job. Because you know you, I know you you might be working somewhere doing a great job. Actually, you might be the best developer there, but you know, you being a dev best developer in a company does not mean that you are the best developer to yourself. So you might be the best developer to a company, but when you meet other people, you feel like I'm not at all. So what happens? This way, people actually divorce. These developers actually devote their time, do some late nights, not sleep at all, plus light, and so as to actually learn and keep actually uh, growing. So your job as a developer is just to develop, but to continually learn how to develop better and grow. Thank you. So you, uh, this is an open source project that I have. This open source project helps you actually split your, your backend into frontend. So this is actually for frontend developers or guys who want to do frontend. So I wrapped up everything for you. Uh, I, done, I did a very big .js file. I actually do does all the task automation files for you. I also ordered your directory structure. I'm going to add it to your one. And once I add it to your one, you can always, you can always pull it and you have a front end directory structure application and everything. I've already built that for you and you just need to run grant and you're good to go. So thank you guys. Much love. Uh, for anybody with questions to him, please. Please feel free. I'm uh, used uh, sales and I see just met you.